Hello and welcome to this special exploring session as we look at um, uh, Banks Bay Horse in a Trance, a discourse set down in a merry dialogue between Banks and his beast. And of course, uh, this is not a play. It is a dialogue. It is a printed thing that was sold and existed uh, in the late uh, 16th century. 1595 is the date I've got on this one. That might have been slightly earlier than that. I don't know. Um, and Banks uh, and his horse were very, very famous uh, in the 1580s. Uh, they appeared as, uh, as performing. Uh, this horse would perform all sorts of feats, uh, being able to count and do all those horsey tricks that uh, uh, worked very well. And they were both became incredibly well known. Uh, hence this uh, mention and this the fact that someone decided to write an entire thing about this horse and his owner. Um, and in the logic of this, the horse is so intelligent and so clever and is able to do so many great tricks that he's been Mr. Edded. Uh, for the purposes of the uh, the uh, the readership, and the horse actually can talk and has a conversation with uh, with Banks. Uh, we've already looked at uh, this text in passing, or we've touched upon it on the podcast when we were talking about Richard Tarleton, because there was a story about Richard Tarleton and this horse um, in uh, in Tarleton's jests. Um, and there's all sorts of really interesting questions that have arisen from some of the sessions we've done recently about how, how the reputation of Tarleton and the reputation of this horse become intermingled um, by, uh, by this, this story and uh, whether they, they had interactions in real life or not. We may go into this a little later on as we go. To read this dialogue, uh, we have uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, people in the room uh, to help uh, saunter through the text. So um, uh, taking us out into the stables, uh, reading Banks today is... Hello there, my name's Sasha Cooper and I'm a professional actress, performer, director and writer from Brighton in the UK. And, uh, and uh, taking us on a, a, a brisk canter, uh, reading today the part of the horse, Morocco is... Hi, I'm Ruth Evans. Um, I'm a specialist in uh, later medieval literature and I'm based in St. Louis, Missouri in the US. And lurking on the platform as Minister Without Portfolio is... muted at the moment. Liza Graham, general early modern geek, and I really like horses. <laughs> Indeed. There isn't a play that can't be improved with the appearance of a horse. Uh, running theme, actually, on these exploring sessions so far. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I'll be uh, attempting to uh, guide us through this text uh, with a certain amount of uh, alacrity and fun. Um, so we're going to start with the opening material. Uh, it's written and intituled to mine host of the Bell Savage. Um, and all his honest guests by John Dando, the weird drawer of Hadley, and Harry Runt, head ostler of Bosom's Inn. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, um, yes, so uh, John, John Dando and Harry Runt uh, there. So they have uh, opening a dedication to the reader. So, and Sasha will be reading that. Yeah. To the reader. Gentle readers, or gentlemen readers, which you will, though it passed manners in verses to stand like a couple of eavesdropping knaves, and steal away a discourse betwixt Banks and his bay horse from Bell Savage without Ludgate, which in our conscience we must confess is a kind of cousining, and in a manner such as a matter as if we should have gone into a cook shop in Fleet Lane, and with the smell of roast meat Build our bellies, not emptying our purses, a flat robbery, and by a figure such a piece of filching as is punishable with rib roast among the turnspits at Pie Corner, where a man of an ill mind may break his fast with the scent of a piece of beef pulled piping hot out of the furnace. Yet, considering the case as it concerns the Commonwealth and the nature of the subject handled betwixt this horse and his master, which not any in the world, I promise ye, heard or understood, but, under, but ourselves that came hither upon other business, we could not choose but do as we have done. 
very pure love to our country leading us to lay our wits together and present the world with this pamphlet, which, if it may be not mistaken, may as well serve to dry away pastime and good company as the finest philosophical discourse you can light upon. If it hang not well together, think the fault is ours that carried it not well away, for truly there never was horse in this world answered man with more reason, nor never man in this world reasoned more sensibly with a horse than this man and this horse in this matter, as for example, and so committing you not to prison, no, but to the reading of this dialogue, we end our epistle to the reader. There's lots of really nice bits in that. I do like that. It's very light. Um, you know, as the finest philosophical discourse you can light upon. Um, and that whole thing about the, the smell of roast meat uh, filling our bellies, not emptying our purses. Um, and yeah, it's, it is that thing also when we're doing these kind of prose, um, the way sentences just never end. They just flow into each other in a way that is really quite difficult to manoeuvre and you have to sort of get your, click your head into it. Um, uh, any, any thoughts about that just as, as, as a nice little uh, uh, epistle? I, I really like that. There's so much nice things in it. <laughs> Certainly trying to get on side people, you know, an audience that might be, I don't know, not able to buy roast meat at will and might be interested in, you know, hearing something that was on their side. I kind mm -hmm. of like that. that. That kind of sets up a kind of imagined audience. Mm. And I like the conceit that it's an overheard conversation, like this might be true. Mm. <laughs> I, just, I, I, I just love the scent. Uh, you know, I love the sense and the sensory work that comes from it as well. Mm. Beautiful. I, I wonder if the overhearing and the um, and the the scent metaphor might indicate that this was a, as it were, a bootleg text. That it was not official merchandise published with Banks's sanction, or <laughs> or possibly even not with the landlord of the Bell Savages sanction, mm -hmm. because because it would make sense for this to be Banks related merch that the landlord of the Bell Savage could sell when they weren't performing, uh, but maybe it was just a couple people trying to cash in. Who knows. Mm. Yes, it's, you know, it's written and in titled to, to mine host of the Bell Savage. You know, they're, they're, they're being very, you know, they're, they're, they're obviously trying to say, uh, you know, it's, surely it's fine, mate, isn't it? Okay, look, we, lo we love you. Fan art, fan art, uh, <laughs> kind of thing there. <laughs> That's yeah. why I think the Commonwealth is something that's going to come up in the course of the pamphlet, though. So that that kind of looking out for a, you know everyone's state is at least raised as a as an idea mm. um you know and if you don't like it uh the the argument is that this is as good an argument you, your discourse you're gonna ever hear from a horse i mean you know what can you compare it to if you don't enjoy this you know have you heard anything from another horse before you know <laughs> are they doctor do it all that <laughs> mm. A little early for that. Um, <laughs> That's why it was supposed to be a joke. Sorry. Yes. No. No. I sorry. <laughs> um, okay. We will dive into the dialogue itself then to uh, see what we get uh, out of that. So um, yeah, the inter uh, in uh, interlocutors, uh, Banks and his horse, will now speak one after the other in dialogue fashion. Hola, Morocco, whose mare is dead, that you are thus melancholy. Up, I say, let you and me confer a little upon the course, whereby matters and dealings may seem to be so. You know my meaning. Oh, whereby matters and dealings may seem for to be. Very good, sir. Spoke like a wholesome haberdasher, and as wisely by a lady master, as he that was sworn to his wife's friends not to credit out his wares to any man for the first fifteen years he was married. And therewith methinks I see him hang the hat upon the pin again. Was it not so, Morocco? I am glad, sir, to hear you so pleasant in the threshold of my discourse, for I am come in purpose to debate a while and dialogue with you, and therefore have at you after your watering. 
lay out your lips and sweep your manger clean and summon your wits together. For I mean, by mine host leave, to recreate myself a while with your horsemanship. And I am as light, master, to show you some horse play as e'er a nag in this parish. It is a jade can neither whinny nor wag his tail, and you have brought me up to both, I thank you, and made me an understanding horse, and a horse of service, master, and that you know. I, Morocco, I know it, and acknowledge it, and so must thou, if thou hast so much ingenuity, confess my kindness. Thou art not only, but only bow also bound to honest banks, for teaching thee so many odd pranks. I have brought thee up right tenderly, as a baker's daughter would bring up a cosset by hand, and allow it bread and milk by the eye. Myas peccatum habes, master, you have the more to answer, God help you. For I warrant you, though I say it that should not say it, I eat more provender in four and twenty hours than two of the best geldings that Robin Sneebor keeps, that are hires for two shillings a day apiece. Two shillings, Morocco? Nay, what sayest thou by half a crown and ten groats? Marry, I say, three days hire is worth four such horses, saddles and all. For I buys them for ten pence a saddle at St Giles, one with another. And those accoutrements are suitable to his steeds. Methinks such steed should stand a man in small stead. By that he had rid some five miles out of town. Yea, be sure, or half five miles either. And commonly the saddle falls asunder and splits in two pieces at the town's end, and one side takes his journey towards Uxbridge and the other towards Staines, to stop mine host cushions of the George. Why, that's some quick boy for the Waymen of the West Country. broken ware with the hostlers for peace and horse bread, and they return them a horseback to Peter Pimp the Patchpanel. Morocco, thou knowest where I am now. Not I, truly, master, unless you mean that shrewd saddler that served you so ill the last term. And as I trow, his name was not Peter, his name was John Indifferent. For a wrought, methought, as if had not cared whether it earned your money or no. Beshrew him, Morocco, a deceived my hope in a good part of purple velvet hose that I purpose should have made me a sternly saddle. Oh, master, you are to purpose, and he dispose of those hose then were your breeches in his hands, and sweetly he handled them as you know. Hear me thinks had you sucked up but a quarter of sack. A quart of sack, I should have said. See how my mind was Master Patini's upon the bag of oats, etc. Or had you come in but reasonably loaded from the tavern, or taken some of the excellent muscadine at the horn, why, what an occupation might you apprehend to rail horribly against these mechanical fellows of the town, but so they have it, care not how they come by it. Was but a venereal sin in this saddler to nickel you, or nick you rather, of an old piece of velvet hose. But what think you by him that had the conscience to ask fourteen yards of satin for a suit of apparel, and not to put in nine of them? Yea, Morocco as well as of him that sold it for eighteen shillings a yard, being not worth ten. Oh, we gave time, master, and then te take heed of that while you live. In space grows grace, and in prosperity of the satin will swell wonderfully. I am full as fast in a cunning stealer's hand. A hard heart hath he that hath such a hand to cut such large thongs of another man's leather and lap himself in a gentleman's livery. Tush! This is but a petty matter to stand upon. And yet, Morocco, I dare say it and swear it to thee, because thou art no talker. This petty matter hath pinched nearer that every man weans for. Oh, I am undone now, young gentleman. Well. 
Mortis praestat compone fluctus. Why, master? Of whom should you be afraid? I'm able to justify as much as you say. Indeed, those be the young men that never saw the lions. Young masters and gentlemen of the careless cut, such as care not how they be cut or of what cut they be like. So they may have to follow all fashions, and then they are cut indeed, no force. So they fall into a fashion and walk but 24 turns in pools, let it pack the next day for the third penny. Master M. Nemo cade it all, nisi arse ipso. Birch and green holly, and thou be beaten, boy, thank thine own folly. He that will thrust his neck into a yoke is worthy to be used like a jade. He that hath been a gentleman of fair demeans and will so demean himself to let lands and lordships fly for a little bravery, luat penas and impistrino. Let him cry and let him lie. <laughs> Yea, and die too, for any pity he is like to have at my hands. Why, how now, Morocco? Oh, ye yeah, are too sour. Dare you tell me of my spleen against the saddler and be so bitter against the young gallants of our age? What man, uh, nay, horse, rather, nay, ass as thou art, to become odious to the flower of England with thy foul manners? It is as natural for young men to be brave and amorous as for old men to be grave and serious. Why, cult, then, you'll take upon you, I see? Do you not hear what they say, what scarce vouchsafe you an answer? Petrus aquiem esse consent, nos siam iam apuertos illico nasci senes, neque ilarum asinis esirerum quat per adolescentia. Master, you mistake me. I am no such severe horse nor sullen ass. But I can allow a young gentleman his mad tricks, yea, and his merry tricks too for a need. But master, this Latin I learned when I gambled at Oxford. Est modus in rebus sunt, certi denique fines. This is, it urgeth me thus far, and I speak it in passion too, and with the action of my head and heels, that a mercadore, Nay, a mechanical fellow shall go so far into a gentleman, and a gentleman so far out of himself, and all I has that for one or two terms array, a shall for his life's term and term of life become beggar's bondsman, and usury's vassal. Oh, tempora, oh, mores, oh, poetar and flores. You shall find in an old tract, printed by Wink and De Word, this old said saw. What's a gentleman but his pleasure? Oh, pleasure, what a treasure is it to take pleasure with measure? Measure, Morocco, nay, nay. They that take up commodities make no difference for measure between a Flemish L and an English yard. I know an L Flemish cost English Antony half a yard of the best wear he had. That wear will never see wear again in so good sort as it hath done, nor sit in a shower of rain on the top of Anwell Hill. Go to, master. Hum drum is sauce for a cunny. You and I should do very ill to speak in private. We are so plain. And we'll just pause there. I let it sort of run on because it, it's actually quite difficult to find a place to pause because it, 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 it just keeps, <laughs> going. keeps things going <laughs> back and forth. Um, it is. <laughs> and it's, it's so deep in its own world. I mean, that's the thing as well. I mean, trying to translate that for to, you know, the, to, to get across to people today all the stuff. I mean, even if we know what, you know, there's a lot there, which I suspect... Um, we we won't know um yeah. i'm really quite keen on finding out what that quart of uh is in the text because i starting yeah. to think it isn't sack it's that it's something else back it's something else yeah. uh, i mean you know the saying else that originally something else that has ck in it yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that would make no meaningful sense in the context. <laughs> it wouldn't really, no. Um, so, I mean, it, it, we start with, you know, he, Morocco's a bit sad because uh, his mare is dead. I mean, it's yeah. quite a it's dramatic opening, isn't it? Well, um, okay. There may not be a literal dead mare. Um, whose mare is dead is something that you say to people with a sad face on if you're, a, if you're an early modern person. You sort of walk into the pub and your friend is there crouched over the bar like this and you're yeah. like, whose mare is dead? Um, I, I, are so, you saying that someone, he, basically the opening gambit is why the long face? Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> That's what you say to a horse. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh, thank you. That, that's fab. Um, <laughs> sorry, just literally writing that down in my notes. Um, <laughs> but there's so many. The reference here is, you know, even that thing about I see him hang the hat upon the pin again. That seems to be a reference to some kind of game or mm. pinning the tail on the donkey, hanging the hat on the pin. Mm. Yeah. Um, um, and yet, you know, the, 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 the relationship between them as well, you know, I, I raised you, I, 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 I brought you, I made you the horse that you are today. Um, it's a close friendship for hmm. sure. <laughs> and I like the fact, again, there's a lot of, fra I mean, it says it in the text itself, as we are frank, you know, <laughs> well, well, not, not necessarily frank, but it, it is the, the honesty um between the two of them that's quite striking it's it's actually more detailed um than you give it credit for when you go into it um but yeah there's a no, I, actually, that's a great point and i hadn't thought of that when when does that proverb straight from the horse's mouth when does that come to be around i mean is that could... part, is that part of what this is playing on that the horse speaks truth like could could well be. I mean, yeah. if you think about it, you know, the horse comes out with quite interesting insights into people. I mean, um, I mean, look, for instance, um, where's that? Where, where is that wonderful little thing? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, even as the horse describes locations and you know, like stains, you know, very recognisable things like stains yeah, and stains. Yeah, 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 stains and Uxbridge, um, recognising a lot of those. But you know, I mean, even 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 just on the bit where the horse goes, "Oh, Maester, you are to purpose," and he dispose of those horse then were your breeches in his hand. These are quite detailed observations mm -hmm. from the horse. It's like a completely different insights you know i mean and actually because i've been revisiting the jungle book recently for the children's channel there's a tale in the jungle book that's called his master's servants and funnily enough it's insights from the animals about the perspective of war this is another insight from this is probably one of the earliest insights that we get from an animal's perspective very likely as well the you know there are talking birds in the medieval era a lot. Mm. Mm. Uh, we've, yes. we've, and we've got talking cats. Um, yeah. Yeah. Beware the cat, yeah. yeah. It's certainly oh. one of the earliest ones anyway. Mm. Sure. But it's also part of the whole tradition of Aesop's fables and animal fables, yeah. anyway, which are enormously popular. They're enormously popular all the way through from the classical period until now, where mm. animals would kind of act out things that, that humans would like to do but playing or wouldn't like to do but they playing on yeah. animal characteristics like having long beaks or things like that well mm. true but what i'm trying to get to is you know unlike the ace of fables which are more kind of quick quick one-witted insights this is detailed yeah. this is one of the first detailed insight from an animal um possibly seen to date probably even more detailed than a lot of things, even modern interpretations of things are that are to come. Who knows? And you know, because this horse is a real horse, you know, these could be real details. I mean, that's that's the Ooh, the right. thing. It's uh, you know, he's a famous horse, but you know, people may have seen him. I mean, it's interesting when they're talking about the difference between um, you know hires for different horses, you know, as opposed to obviously yeah. his hire charges. And you know what what value you get out of them? Well, you might get as far as X, and you know the saddle's going to collapse, and you know the, the, that's not the you know, you know the, the, there's 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 practices and things that are 
again within this world that we're we're only able to sort of look at from a distance um, I love that conceit of the saddle falling in half and half of it goes shooting off towards Uxbridge and the other half to stains to <laughs> stop the mine hose cushions of the George, which must be a reference to a pub called the George in Staines. Which either has, you know, has really uncomfortable chairs, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. We, um, whoever wrote this, um, Banks or whomever, whomever else, is actually very canny to put all the complaints about the dodgy used horse dealers and the dodgy tailors and the dodgy saddlers in the mouth of the horse yes. rather than of the person. Um, one thing we do know about Elizabethan Londoners is that they were incredibly litigious uh, mm. and having the horse say it, well, the horse can't get sued. Yes, um, yes, I mean, I don't know, uh, you know, whether, you know, I don't know anything about John Dando or Harry Runt to, you know, our reputed to be the authors who overheard this conversation. Um, whether that's a pseudonym or they're real people, that's something, again, we can maybe be able to find more out uh, in the future. Um, Great names, though. Dandy. Yeah. Bosoms <laughs> in. Um, yeah, and this, 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 the, the, and the, that, that saddle detail then sort of dr draws us into other things to do with... Um, velvet hose and uh, 14 yards of satin for a suit of apparel and that then leads us into the young nowadays I think uh, is that you know because yeah. the horse is really really bitter against the young uh, gallants of our age yeah the horse hates <laughs> millennials the horse is pretty yeah sour about quite a few of these practices mm. yeah you well, know, the, the horse has skin in the game I don't know that but, you know. <laughs> Well, these, you know, these these young masters wearing all these 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 new fashions, and they literally just take it for a turn round Pauls, you know. <laughs> Is that peacocking basically what they're doing there? And um, mm. it, and and the the implication being that you give the tailor fourteen yards of satin that he asks for to make you an outfit, and he only uses some of it, and presumably he sells the rest on because he's a yeah. dishonest yeah. man. Mm. And. Um, the, the, and you know, the horse is very educated, both he and Banks, they bandy Latin back and forth, they bandy poetry back and forth. Uh, I like the wink into word reference. That's yes, really I know. Yes. That's, um, that's pretty good. Like, why, that, 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 the, this old said saw, uh, what's a gentleman but, uh, but his pleasure, and I'm trying to think where that actually literally comes from. Um, it, it sounds awfully familiar. It bounces off my head like something John Florio would have said, but... Mm. Uh, I I can't confirm that. Yeah, it's it's, it's something again. We can. We, I'd, I'd really like to pick out. I mean, I love the way that he learned his Latin when he gambled at uh, at uh, at Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't waste his time there. No, absolutely not. Uh, I mean, it's got just such life, but um, and it really just speaks to its time. It's just it is that problem that it just comes at you as this this other conversation that you're only half privy to all the uh, it, it's like being in a room with with two really good friends and you're the third wheel mm. and you're listening in and going i don't get all the in jokes right uh, and you know mm -hmm. sorry what what's that it's, oh no you had to be there i i want to know about i whether whether the l flemish that cost english antony half a yard of the best wear he had um whether that's a reference to an Anglo-Dutch battle or maybe English Antony got venereal disease from a Dutch person and, mm. and half his yard is gone. Um, <laughs> oh, that kind of yard. That's funny. I hadn't thought of that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I like that. But there is uh, a reference to the pox later on in it, so... Yeah. Yeah. Um... That's yeah. great. I hadn't thought of that. That would be well. They say he'll never see where again. And what do we know about where? There's a big bed there. <laughs> um, there's also that 15th century poem that has three women discussing their husbands where. Oh Maybe yeah. Oh yeah. yes. You What's you do it? get that. Yeah. And it's kind of again, it's an eavesdropping thing. You overhear these women talking about their husbands where. Yes, I remember this now. God, I can't remember what it's called, but it's very yeah. It's yeah. in your face that poem, isn't it? If I remember it is, correctly, it is it's so oh, it is yeah. so blatant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Can't remember what it's called though, but 
Yeah. Again, that's that. Uh, that there's some. Um, uh, any additional thoughts about um, uh, where we're where we're we're at so far? We're not quite halfway through, but we're nearly there. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying the ride. It's a it's a good little canter. Um, there's no tradition of. Or is there, is there any tradition of pantomime horses at this period, or is that later? There, there, there are horses in, in Morris Dance, in, in mm. Morris Dance. There are. That's right. There are. There I mean, are I don't know if that's a one-person costume, like a hobby horse. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. I, I, I mean, we've, we have come across horses a few times, but they tend to be real yeah. horses um, in the text we've done so far to... Um, and pantomime horses didn't really emerge until the first pantomime end of 70, near the end of the 1700s. So, yeah. It's that question of whether it's a, it's a two person horse or a one person. But yeah. hobby horses, yeah, folk, kind of folklore hobby horses. But this yeah. is an educated horse. Mm. Very educated. He's been to Oxford. Yeah. yeah. I'm intimidated by this horse. <laughs> He's got a better degree than I have. <laughs> than any of us have, really. <laughs> Ruth, watch out, the horse is after your job. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> well, if Incitatus could become a senator. Um... <laughs> okay, let's, um, let's just... Um... Let's, let's go forward. Um... Where had we got to? Plain Morocco, yeah, Nay, yeah. I think. Yeah. So we've just had the potentially uh, uh, venereal disease uh, back and forth about and, and sexual innuendos, possibly stuff going on. Uh, and Banks continues moving forward. Plain Morocco, Nay, and I were plain as I will be. I shall cry out right, but in this I agree with thee, and with thee the world agrees. And besides tears and commiseration of the state of gentlemen that are ungentlified, why, I might say, dishonoured themselves by buying and selling. Have they so, master? Why would he be a buyer, then? Why would he be a seller? This buying and selling, by all men's telling, is game without swelling to him that sells his dwelling for his bonds can selling. <laughs> oh, good Morocco. I see now a dozen of bread do's as much with you as three pipes of tobacco takes in, a, in an old alehouse in a weak brain. I am not drunk, master, after my watering, that you need to challenge me thus. I know what I say, and I say what I know. To buy this measure and this momentary pleasure with so much treasure, to sell seat and seizure and repent at leisure. Go to, master. He is a bad waster that consumes his days and hours and reaps poor and pleasure. Mille. Cambridge and Oxford can record, and the foul dolorous fortune of many a fair board. What it is? What it is to come into the churches for aglets or brooches of these pure appearing asses that, like simple glasses, seem that they are not. Let them storm, I care not, unpitied mighty be that embases his degree with this indignity. I tell you, master, for a truth, I tell you too. I know a man that in this town had a Bible lying on his shop board and sold but three yards of satin unto a gentleman and forswore himself at least three times in the coping. And yet the book lay open before him and he came new from reading of Solomon's Proverbs. That had once been that had been somewhat gross in him if he had been reading the twentieth of Exodus. No, no, his mind was on the twentieth day of the month following when his money was due. Tis good to have an eye on to the main. Housekeeping is chargeable and rent must be paid. The landlord will have his due. Kayot emptor, let the tenant look to it. The landlord will lead to the devil and the tenant will follow after. What else? 
they be relatives, landlord and tenant are as pater and filius. Oh, master, I could relate to you of these relatives if it became me to speak like a commonwealth's man. What an abuse is engendered twixt the landlord and the tenant. Occasion of what, Morocco? Of more amiss by G's than easily amended is, of bordery and beggary and such like matters, master. Ambu by arum collegia pharmacopoli, mendici mimi balatrones hoc genus omne. Cry out and complain for the loss of this good landlord's worship. God rest his soul, says TB. We could have had no wrong while he lived. So he had had his rent at the day. The devil and John of Comber should not have fetched Cape L to Bridewell. No. Nor all the court whipped CF at the cart, I'll tell you, master, come what complaint could have come against Petticoat Lane, Smock Alley, Shaw Ditch, or Rotten Row. There were champions and spokesmen for this crew, other manner of fellows are wist than you think for, such as sit in their satins and rich furs, and with a dash of a pen in a counting house, could do more than the proudest plaintiff that commonwealth any, commoneth any matter, commonseth any matter or suit against this sisterhood. Yea, and seal up his letter and their lips both at once, that murmur anything against the inhabitants of this holy corner. Master. I could have showed you the copy of a letter that was lost in this yard by chance, written by a man of some account, so favourably to the treasurer of Bridewell, in the behalf of an honest tenant of his. Such a tenant master as had her name a tenendo, and would hold so fast between the thighs that shame it was for him that had any shame to be so shameless to use any means to keep her from open shame. Thou speakest of manners against some or other Morocco, and perhaps thou meanest that drab that the last day, when she saw thee here do thy tricks, said thou wert a devil and I a conjure. Against her, master? No, of mine honesty. She is but a poor whore. To her, I mean. Tush, she that I talk of can entertain you with a dozen of tiffity taffety girls in a morning. Aye, and the worst of them, when she is at the worst, shall have a wrought waistcoat on her back and a lockram smock worth threepence, as well rent behind as before, I warrant you. Those rents by your leave, Morocco, help to pay the landlord's rent at the quarter's end. Aye, master. And the landlord, by your leave, helps to rent some of them between the quarters. That's but a trick of youth, lad. Omnis homnom mendax, every man may amend. True, master. Et ut hora seek wita. A loves a whore as his life. He will forbear as long as she will bear, and that's car me and car thee, knave he and quain she. Had need be of exceeding patience, Morocco, to forbear as long as she'll bear, for a better bearing beast is not in all shoreditch, nor hound's ditch neither, than this beastly beast that I think thou meanest. But speak not so loud, for and if the landlord heard you, he would answer for her. And I think we'll just pause there because it's suddenly got a little dark in here. Um, yeah, just a bit. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, so um, paying for rent uh, through through services rendered. Um, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's it because we've gone from what seems to be very much the possibly... Uh, 
getting their own but it does feel like the author has an axe to grind with some people whose names are are, are, are not going to be mentioned um mm. there's still that sort of mentioned three yards of satin there's there's definitely something to do with someone being swindled out of something and you know uh, being quite annoyed and it just keeps keeps just turning over here and then it turns to this unscrupulous landlord mm. um i mean this is quite libelous if it's true um Incredibly libelous, if true. Um, yeah, thoughts. Yes, quick, swift turn. But uh, it's interesting. It seems to be not just you, you know, not just looking at the, um, the services rendered aspect here, but it seems to be looking, looking in a weird sort of way, the pros and cons of um, renting and tenancy at the time. Um, don't know why I seem to remember something like this, but there was something going back. Oh gosh, I can't remember the day now, the date now of it. But there was something going on round about this sort of period, in which landlords were being pulled to pieces in texts as a whole. Um, some kind of corruptness going behind closed doors that kind of thing, not not just with services rendered, etc. <coughs> but there was a very significant amount of this happening. It could be a send-up, could be something to be bringing it to the fall, maybe. Um, but at the same time, the horse is very... Uh, dig, 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 dig. It's constantly digging in the old, um, twisting the old screw in, right. as and when you can, isn't he? He is, absolutely. But this does feel to me like it's very pointed and that they, they have someone in mind. Mm. I mean, the thing about, they're talking generally about the landlord and the tenant, but that reference to landlord and tenant are as parter and filius. Yes. I mean, obviously there's a kind of, you know, a kind of mockery of the tr kind of Trinity mockery or something going on there. But but it also suggests some some very pointed reference to a specific people and a specific mm. abuse and y yeah um, sorry Ruth go no go on Liza I'm done yeah it does um it it does it, it does suggest that there's a prominent sex worker who has a landlord right. who's her protector uh, that in the latter part of this dialogue. The earlier part, uh, for those listening who don't know, Bridewell was a women's prison. Yeah. Um, so uh, a person writing to the treasurer of Bridewell on behalf of one of his tenants was writing on behalf of a woman prisoner um, and who, who presumably was, the text implies what, um, that this person, that this person of note who wrote the letter was sexually indebted or bound to the the woman who was the prisoner, um, and and Banks says, "Do you mean that? Do you mean that cheap drab who came and and heckled us the other day?" And the horse is like, "No, I don't mean her. She's a poor whore. To her, I mean." Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. Now. Um, you know, it is tempting, it is so tempting to think of Black Luce here, um, who uh, is one of the few uh, Shoreditch sex workers whose name and reputation we know. And she did have a male landlord that she worked with. Um, oh, right, I don't know, I don't know her. But, but the, um, she's a candidate for, okay, no duck, no duck. Uh, she has something to do with the duck man and we're not sure what. Um, anyway. Uh, oh, yes. I know where you're going with this. I know exactly where you're going with this. Interesting. Um, but, uh, you know, she sure as hell wasn't the only madam working at the time. This was a big city and the sex trade was a big trade and there were endless jokes about it. So... Mm. Um, and, right. and, and talking, you know, these are these are entertainers, the the horse and banks. So you know, they 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 are sort of intimately connected with th that sort of whole whole area of 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 life. Right. It's interesting though that they name that they they refer by name or, or by sobriquet to the guy who deals in dodgy horses and dodgy tack, and they will not name this per this woman. Hmm. Um, presumably, she's she has certain power in that area at least 
Mm. But that long speech by the horse is very, you know, mentioning all those people like TB and John of Comber and CF and Kate L. And that, that just looks so pointed. Mm. Mm. Twisting the old screw in the old wound. Mm. Right. So yeah. As and, you it, said. I, I, and it's couched again with these, these, these things about satins and rich furs because a real clothing uh, uh, a, apparel fixation um, in this. Uh, seems to be a well, signifier I about wealth. People, as we just said, are making money out of, you know, doing people out of, you know, not making their gown with as much fabric as they're given and mm. selling the rest. And, and all the, and the sanctuary laws are still in force, right? Mm. We're out, I don't know. Or is um, it outside the sumptuary laws now? We're outside the city of London. The Bishop of Winchester runs Southwark. And he famously protects prostitutes as long as they give him a percentage. Right. They're called Winchester geese. Um, right. And I mean, I think that's uh, John of Cumber is interesting. Uh, mm. He there's a play called John of Kent and John of Cumber about a ma magician's duel. So the the devil and John of Cumber is like the devil and his all his little wizards. Yes, I, 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 we'll be reading that hopefully in the next couple of months. So um, I'm, I'm sort of hoping that there might be some connection that we will find that... that, that yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know um, that. Uh, just to go back to actually uh, the last sequence we did uh, when you were talking about um, the uh, half a yard, uh, I think uh, commis commiseration on the state of gentlemen that have ungentlified, I, I think that's really just confirming the, that, that, yeah. that whole process. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, and there's a wonderful Alice in Wonderland phrasing as well. I know what I say and I say what I know. Um... Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I love it... the suggestion that the horse might be drunk on horse bread. Yes. Mm, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hence, the, hence the song and dance routine. <laughs> and again, a lot of um, references to um, so, so, sort of areas in Kent and, 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 and you know, sort of northish London again um, during that section, and also highlighting the old taverns, you know, mm -hmm. and it's the high, it's the highlighting of the taverns, which is quite interesting as well. Um, like that's got to be a huge significance. I'm wondering if it's more of a significance, and not, and I'm not just talking about going into the drunk speech of the halls. I'm wondering if there was more of a significance regarding maybe sponsorship, whether they had to mention these places in order to get the sponsorship behind this. Or if this was a book to be sold in taverns, maybe, maybe they just wanted as many landlords to be, as many taverns to be name-checked as, as possible, so they'd sell the book. Right. And they're certainly not having a go at abuses of taverns, like giving people, you know, half, you know, half measures. There's not, been nothing about that so far. It's other kinds of abuses. Mm. Yeah. Um, Ruth, can I ask you a question about Latin? <laughs> you me. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I spotted a couple of places where they say something in Latin and then they say something in English and the something in English uh, isn't the same thing it's as the Latin. It's not the same. It's a jokey mistranslation. So like, omnis homo mendax doesn't mean every man may amend, does it? No, it doesn't. And I love that thing where the horse says, et ut hora seek vita. He loves uh, the as well. hora as his life, yeah. but it means- The wordplay. Yeah, it's great. It's absolutely brilliant. It's a kind of cross-linguistic punning, which I really appreciate a lot. Mm, yes. It means um, fashion your life to the hour, or as the hour is, so your life goes, yeah. Yes, yes. and on this homo mendax is every man lies? Or yes. Every... yes, every man's a liar. So I, this could possibly, I mean, we're spitballing here, but I wonder if someone from the Inns of Court wrote this. There was a, a famous, there were like famous relationships between the Inns of Court and the sex trade in, in East London as a whole. Uh, no pun intended. Dear God, yeah. you guys should carry on and I should shut up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's it's definitely this is this is part of a, a, a debate um, uh, tradition that you know goes into performance, but also publishing going on, 
you know, for, you know, hundreds of years. So, um, yeah, that's, that's highly, highly possible. I mean, the, the, the author is very, very good at doing what they're doing. I mean, you know, yes. the problem with the text is not the text. Mm -hmm. It's, it's that there's 400 odd years between us, um, making it very yeah. difficult to decode it. But, you know, as a, as a dialogue, it's, it's really, you know, I, I kind of didn't want to stop us at any point because it was flowing so nicely. Um, yeah. It really has a natural flow to it. It's so easy to read as well. You know, you, know, you, you just want to keep going with it mm. a lot. It's really, really nice. Yeah, if we and think I of think there's but... some, you can, if you are performing this, you could have good fun with the idea of when the horse is coming out with those kind of, um, you know, nonsensical, this buying and selling by all men's selling, you could almost have the horse, you know, pouring the ground with its hoof, you know, and in a rhythmic way, like they used to get horses to count by doing that. Mm, which was exactly what Bank, uh, Banks' horse did. Uh, it was one of his tri tricks right. in his armory. Um, and, um, you could really horse it up, you know. Yeah. Horseplay. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, horsing around. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, if only we could get Bojack Horseman to play this, you know, this would be so... <gasps> it would be perfect, I was going to say. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Those of you who don't know Bojack Horseman, look him up on Netflix. Oh, I'll look him up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I'd, love to, I'd love to think what he thought of this material. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> You'd probably be drunk reading it. Yeah. Let's face it. Yeah. If yeah, that that sequence where they ask is he drunk? He, he yeah, he he would definitely do it drunk. Um, so. Of course he would. <laughs> Just to, to go back to the Latin and what you were asking about, Loisa, that the lot the horse's long speech that that has that ambu biarum collegia farmer capilla. I don't think that's nonsense. Uh -huh. I don't. I think that's just. I don't think that means anything at all. Um, oh, a mendici is i hope genus omni is good latin but the rest of it is just kind of made up it's nonsense i wonder if there's a if, if whoever wrote this did come from the inns of court if there's a better known if there's a better known latin thing that it's it's bastardizing you know mm. like a college grace or something right i just spitballing here yeah, no, I, I, I think there's, there's, there's definitely more to decode from what the Latin is doing, because it is yeah. doing something clever, but again, it's quite difficult for us to, to possibly get. Uh, any additional thoughts before we go into the final, final chunkette? It's quite chunky as well. It's less dialogue and more uh, speechy. Uh, did we get to a horse? I think so. Yeah. I think so. So, uh, yes, we're still... Uh, Oh, is that right? Hmm? I begin as I think so. Um, I, maybe you should go from from Sasha's but speak not too loud just to give, give the cue. Just in case, yeah, I think so. Yes, but yes, that'll be good. Yes, uh, Banks, Banks dialogue before the horse says I think so would be good, yes. Yeah. But speak not so loud, for and if her landlord heard you, he would answer for her. I think so, has answered so long for her that I can scarce answer for himself. And I speak not so loud that I fear him. Male audit to be quay. Master, I hear very badly everywhere. And worse, I will hear. And I hold on, yea, master, and lose hearing and seeing too. And I read it and see it, as I has done these dozen years. Well, what's that to the purpose? These wrongs are private, and touch himself, and rack not the Commonwealth as thou its slavest. Oh, master, and you know nothing. For understanding you, as of nouns, some be substantives, some be adjectives. So, of landlords, some of them be covetous, and some be lecherous. And he is both. Sayest me so? Well then, Morocco, whether does more harm in the Commonwealth the covetous or the lecherous landlord? Tush, master, that question is no question. For though it be a question between the covetous and the prodigal, yet it is no question between the covetous and the lecherous. The lecherous landlord 
hath his wench at his commandment, and is content to take wear for his money. His private scutchery wounds not the commonwealth farther than that his whore shall have a house rent free, when his honest neighbour's wife and children shall neither have a piece of a house or a household loaf for him. Let him pass for a farting churl, and where his mistress favours, his rubies and precious stones on his nose, etc. And this etc. shall, if you will, be the perfectest pox that ever grew in Shoreditch or Southwark. And there have been big inflammations and more unquenchable than the great fire that burned so much blue threed on the top of Fish Street Hill. But the covetous landlord is the caterpillar of the Commonwealth. He neither fears God nor the devil, nor so he may rack it out, cares not what tenant he receives. He is no wencher, pray God he be no bencher. He fits warm at home and sets down his accounts and says to himself, my houses go now but for 20 pounds by the year. I'll make them all bawdy houses and they will yield me twice as much. Upon the exchange comes to him one or two honest men to take them at his hands. The poor artificer or his like of what trade soever offers him the rent it hath gone for and sureties perhaps. Yea, say so, good security, and four pounds a year for a house, comes Pierce Panda and bawdy Beatrice, his wife, too, that I warrant you were known well enough what they were, I too, that have been as well carted and whipped and covered with dirt over head and ears, and they forsooth will begin the world anew again, having a fresh wench or two that came but from the carriers that morning. Though she had tapped many a can in Long Lane at Bartholomew Tide. With this stock of wenches will this trusty Roger and his Beatrice set up forsooth with their pamphlet pots and stewed prunes, nine for a tester in a sinful saucer. And they will offer this covetous and wretched landlord five pounds by the year, so yea, six pounds to have his house and his countenance withal. But he that will go to the devil for money will admit them with favour, and so let them have his house, with promise of anything whatsoever in his power. Yea, and if occasion serve, we'll write and speak and take pains and play the suitor and bear with them in anything, so there be any mean to do it, and he to be sure of his rent. God is his judge, he does it for no fleshly respect, but even of a mere worldly motion, to bear sin out with sin, and lechery with covetousness. <laughs> Let the parish complain. Why, says he, what should I do? I have my rent paid me at the day. I must make money of my land. And so let them do their hearts out, thinks he. I shall have my rent the readier. This cormorant is he that cares not how he gets it, so he have it. This stimfulist is he that with five or six tenements and the retinue thereunto belonging, infects the air with stench and poisons that parish, yea, and twenty parishes off with the contagion of such carrion as lies there in their humble baths and stink at both ends like filthy green elder pipes. For him and them, master, such landlords and such tenants. Good master, wish as I wish. What's thy wish, Morocco? That at the quarter day the parish would of their own devotion to the commonwealth bestow a banquet upon them of ale and cakes in the cage and a hundred or two of good faggots to consume the bodies and bones of them all and every mother's child such landlords and such tenants as so much against conscience receive and deceive and day by day, hour by hour, cheat, cousin, catch and devour and pillage from gentlemen, prentices and good fellows, ab uno usque ad mile, even from the outside to the inside, from the cloak to the shirt, 
leaving nickel never thrive, never a wench in the chamber or penny in the purse. Morocco, pray thy wish take effect. I wish for every parish so pestered with such tenants and tenements, God put into their minds to be but at cost, and charges for the faggots, for ales and cakes I were merest if it cost five marks. But how does this landlord fall into the premier? Why is thy malice so great against them, when tis the board and the hall that make all this stir? Oh, master, miserable landlords are cause of all this mischief. Is he that because he will have an unreasonable rent will uphold any, any villainy in his tenant? A slave to money, a pander to the board, a pillar, nay, a pillow, and a bolster to all the roguery committed in his houses. And yet will this filthy fellow sit at his door on a Sunday in the high street, and my mistress his wife by him, and there forsooth talk so saint-like of the sermon that day, and what a good piece of work the young man made, and what a goodly gift of utterance he had. But not the value of a pound of beef will I give him, were his gift of utterance comparable to St. Augustine's or Chrysostom's eloquence. Swear a will, and forswear upon the workday, as well as any. And if Picards are sit in place of authority, Oh, how severe will he be in all his proceedings against a young or good fellow in any trifling matter. Then it takes upon him, and not a little. Sir, says he, what did you do in such an house? Wherefore came you thither? And lay the law and the prophets too, and so rate a gentleman well descended, merely privileged with a furred gown and a nightcap when indeed his bringing up hath been in beggary and slavery illiberally, having spent his time in conference with the water tankard at the convict, lying miserably and for sparing of wood, loading his gown sleeve with fuel from the haberdashers and wearing his hands in a frosty morning by the fugitive flames of a few waste papers, a natural enemy to all learning and liberality. Oh, master, such a churl as you and I saw here last day, talk with two soldiers in the yard, and put his hand in his pouch, and gave them ne'er a penny. Didst thou see that, Morocco? Well, there be too many such as he. Yet there is a choice number of sober citizens that have golden minds, and golden purses withal. That I know well, master. And to them that have such golden minds, I wish golden minds. <laughs> Master, I protest to you, I speak it not to flatter, but in reproach of those money mongers, those lease mongers, those cannibals that dishonour the city wherein they dwell. But uprightly I speak it, that you may not think I rail upon malice against any private man for any private quarrel. There are many that beautify London for their good parts, who being civilly and well brought up are affable to strangers, charitable to the poor, liberal to scholars, and such as citizens should be, dutiful to their prince and devout to their city. But as cockle is ever among corn and dross among gold, so will those soul churls cumber the best corners and march cheek by jowl among the better many with as great show of devotion and charity as the best. From such dissembling holiness, such double wickedness, good Lord, deliver us. Tis almost supper time, Morocco. I hear mine host call. You have done pretty well for two points. Refer the rest till another time. As you please, master, and let this be our first lecture of the anatomy of the world. If the trance hold me but till next term, when now I have but with a dry foot overlet these matters, I may chance of these and more leave a deeper print, and having handled a case of commodities, will say somewhat further of their discommodities and differences even as the bit of reason shall lead me. 
Even so, I commit you to your supper and myself to my litter, for I promise you, I am not a little weary of gambling this afternoon. And thus it ends. It's, it's, a, it's a clever text. What I like about it is that it lulls everybody in with a sort of, you know, the, 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 the back and forth and, and the material at the beginning of the text. It creates all this momentum. Um, it, it, it leads us then to the point where the horse is going to deliver the catechism, is going to, you know, re really ram home the point about abuses by landlords and really goes for it. Um, and you know, w w you know, the, we're, we're there with the horse by that point. You know, we're we're on the horse's side, um, mm. and this horse is is going to make a very very powerful um, comment about that. You know, people always blame the people at the bottom, but they they don't blame the people at the top. And um, and it it's it's really nicely done, I have to say. And it's um, you know, there are some nice people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, careful not to completely de um, uh, attack everyone. But you just, yeah, Banks basically sets it all up. Uh, who does more harm in the Commonwealth, the covetous or the lecherous landlord? And it's just like, right, hold my point. Yeah. No so bar. The whole idea of having Banks and the horse is not, it's not really so much connected to the specific show of Banks and the horse. It's a kind of thing to hang the whole idea on that avoids litigation or anything, but allows the abuses to be detailed without being able to kind of nail them to anyone. Mm. It's not that the, I mean, there's very little, well, there's not a great deal made of the horsiness of the horse, mm. except it's kind of comic at the end about, you know, you'll have your supper, I'll have my litter, but I mean, yeah, all the horsey stuff is at the very beginning with you know yeah. Winnie and and stuff, and, and again it's it's lull it's it's luring people in for what is the actual purpose of the of the pamphlet. Landlord abuses, rack, mm. all of that stuff. Do people remember that from back in the seventies? Yeah, bad landlord practices. Mm. Um. Yeah, it, I, I mean, it, you know, it does 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 work very well. I think, um, you know, it's, it, it is again very nicely construct uh, constructed. Um, it is. Yeah, nicely well rounded, good journey, and interesting balance as well between the classes. I yeah. found in the whole text. Um, yeah, kind of sending up, you know, the whole thing of don't abuse power. I think that seems to be the main thing behind it you know not not obviously not just what we've been talking about but it's that whole thing if we strip it down to its absolute basic basic thing don't abuse power or money maybe i don't know from the horse's mouth um uh, indeed. the horse does know something about capitalism to be sure he knows in fact he's he's more proficient in socioeconomic theory than most horses that yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the most most horses very disappointing on this front, it has to be said. <laughs> does anyone know what on page eight, well, eight in mind, what is, what's a stimphalist? Or stumpfalist, stumpfalist? I the can't quite find it. I don't think I have page numbers. Uh, okay. It's the long speech of the horse that begins, but the covetous landlord is the caterpillar of the Commonwealth. Ah, yeah, I found it. Yeah. I don't know. Will anyone know what a stimphalist is? Well, of course, there might be there might be the odd letter in there that's uh, that's in error as well. So it might be it might be wrong. Because I wondered about the bumble baths, whether that's humble uh, or not. Um, there's there's a lot of textual work to do uh, to uh, uh, figure out precisely how accurate this transcription is. Um, but no, is the answer from me. Uh, uh, any joy Ooh, from anyone um, else? I found it. I found it. Oh, what is it, Sloisen? Um, One of Heracles' uh, labors was to, uh, was, uh, was the Stymphalian birds who apparently shat on everything. Oh! 
<laughs> Infects the air with stench and poisons yeah. that parish. Mm. Yes, a flock of monstrous man-eating birds with metal beaks and feathers who produced a stinking and highly toxic guano. Wow, brilliant. What an image to throw in. Um... <laughs> I mean, Bumble it's... baths, oh, wow. Bumble it? baths. I, I wonder. I, I also wonder if it's sort of bubble baths, mm. like the bath water bubbling up from from pipes. Mm. Um, hot hot water and stewing were also, you know, associated with the sex trade. Right. Yeah, it's because the stewed uh, prunes, nine to a test, are in a sinful saucer. Uh... Yeah, <laughs> stewed prunes were. Um, stewed fruit in general, but prunes in particular, were um, the mark of a body house because uh, basically the um, the official business of the body house would just be a place where you could come and have some stewed fruit. Uh, <laughs> as, opposed to, uh, as opposed to a place where you could have a hot bath with a person in it. Um, but, but yeah, stewed prunes. <laughs> You might you might be uh, in, indulging in in forbidden fruits there, but at least you'll be kept regular. Uh, so, and what's a pamphlet pot? They set up with their pamphlet pots. Ooh, that's really interesting. Stew prunes in well in a sinful saucer. Haven't quite found that bit. It's just it's literally about pa uh, sinful saucer. Trusty oh. Roger and his Beatrice. Oh yes, I love the names, don't you? The um, yeah. Nicole Never, Thri Never Thrive and Peter Pender and Peter Pander, Pierce Pander is great. Mm. Yeah. Sounds quite Langlandian at that point, doesn't it? Mm. Yes, it does. In fact, and Pierce Pander. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's what Pierce Plowman got up to when he, you know, just, <laughs> he traded up. Uh, <laughs> And enough of this ploughing lark. <laughs> he and went into business. Had enough of his earnestness, yeah. yeah. Just doesn't pay, just doesn't pay. Well, at least now we know how it ended. Yeah. <laughs> at least. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, just, it's just crammed with all these details that you kind of want to just unpack with just never-ending footnotes and that the footnotes could overwhelm the whole text to to such a degree. Um, I bet a bit of Googling would probably give you quite a lot of answers to this stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I, I, it, I, I still I still don't quite know what I'm going to do with it, um, as it were. I mean, that's still that sort of the question of uh, what what is the best outlet for this kind of text? Uh, whether just as an audio thing or trying to turn it into something for an other form of performance? I, I, I genuinely don't know. I, I, I find it fascinating. I really do. I, 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 um, it doesn't help much with the story of Banks and his horse, apart from minor details that might be, might or might not be true. But as we've already found with the story of uh, Banks's horse and Tarleton. There are lots of details in that that are clearly not true. Um, so uh, yeah, there's 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 all those problems of trying to connect literature with reality. Well, I think the visual thing seem, it seems to me it would be good to have a visual thing because I think if you just have it as audio, I think people might have trouble following some of the references. So they need some fun mm. visual stuff to watch, and you could make something of the horse then. Mm. Yeah, it depends yeah. how dead, de deadpan you do it. I mean, you know, just... <laughs> you, could, you could even have visual footnotes, like in PowerPoint, you could have illustrations of, you know, body houses and mm. corrupt landlords and you know, raggedy uh, people and stewed prunes. Um, so my, my general spitballing about this possibly being an Inns of Court production, the last, uh, the last thing the horse says is, uh, well, this be our, let this be our first lecture of the anatomy of the world. Yeah. If the trance hold me but till the next term, mm. uh, then, then I might write some more. Um, so that, I mean, the Inns of Court did operate on terms, so... Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, you did go to Oxford, you see, you know, so that, that whole collegiate as aspect. I mean, there's, that sort of runs through the horse's terms of reference throughout, actually. You know. Very educated horse, yes. Mm. Did the horse teach Banks the Latin? 
Um, it came from the horse's mouth. Mm. The, um, one is going to run and run. Yeah, because how educated is Banks, we're assuming, you know. The horse's yeah. mouth is a truth thing for those who don't know. Um, you can tell the age of a horse and something of the condition by looking at their teeth. Mm. Um, so if you want to know the truth about a horse, look at its mouth, which is oh. why you shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth, uh, uh, because then you're like, ah, oh, you're giving me this horse because it's in bad condition and really old. Okay, so very much final thoughts about uh, Banks Bay Horse in a Trance. Um, anybody got any, any 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 final final things to throw at Paul Morocco? Carrots, throw carrots. <laughs> <laughs> Just what carrots? Uh, so yes, uh, uh, so. Uh, Yes, that's that's it for the moment with Banks Bay Horse. It's um, there's there's a lot more to be said about about this horse in real life uh, that hopefully we'll be putting into things in the podcast or in live shows further down the line. We may be doing something with this material. I do not know. Um, I certainly hope that we'll be doing more dialogues, um, more uh, dialogue forms uh, as well to complement some of the the, the the more dramatic clearly explicitly dramatic material um though at the moment i haven't got any formal plan as to how that might happen so uh there, it will be a bit pick and mix possibly uh with that kind of material coming up thanks to all my readers today and goodbye bye 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 bye, -bye.